Massachusetts has become a battleground state in the Democratic presidential primary. The latest poll shows Bernie Sanders leading Hillary Clinton by seven points here, and the fight for voters is on. As Adam Riley tells us, today featured dueling rallies for the Democrats, with black leaders on one side, Latino leaders on the other. Today's pressers happen in the exact same spot, right in front of the Massachusetts State House. The pro-Clinton people went first. They praised her recent speech on race. She gets it. Touted her record. Has a history of fighting for justice and equality that dates back 40 years. And without mentioning him by name, they took some sharp digs at Bernie Sanders. But at the end of the day, as the secretary so aptly put it, anger is not a plan. After, when I asked about Sanders' unexpectedly strong showing, Clinton supporters insisted they're unfazed. I don't think that she's ever taken any of this for granted, and I think she will fight for every single vote. About an hour later, the Sanders camp showed off his backing from Massachusetts Latinos, including Lawrence City Council President Kendris Vasquez. That we have people living in poverty after having two and three jobs. And immigration rights advocate Patricia Montes. As a Latina, as a woman, as an immigrant, I'm supporting him. And I'm also going to mobilize and organize and motivate other Latino leaders to do the same thing. Again, the rival candidate wasn't mentioned by name until the Q&A, at which point the Sanders faithful were happy to pile on. Let's look at the record of uh, Bill Clinton. He's the one that started this deportation apparatus. For the record, recent polls show Clinton with a comfortable lead in heavily black South Carolina but running neck and neck with Sanders in heavily Latino Nevada. Adam Riley, WGBH News. Joining me are Dante Ramos, op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe. Good to see you again. Frank Phillips, Boston Globe political reporter and State House Bureau Chief. Good to see you too, Frank. Good to see you. So Massachusetts appears to matter in a primary uh, serious way. You've been around as long as God. I mean, is this, has it ever happened before? As long as you and I have been exactly. around. Exactly. Has it ever happened before? Um, I, I think you're over-exaggerating that this is going to be such a, a raucous primary, uh, but it is important. Why am I um, exaggerating? Because uh, it, it, it's a handful of votes. It's not a, it's not a big, big, big issue. It's coming on uh, a Super Tuesday when you have all the vo uh, only Vermont and, and Massachusetts are in New England, and the real battleground states are in Texas and Alabama and the South and Virginia. So it's not. It, I don't think it is uh, as intense as you think it's going to be. It's of some interest, and I think it's interesting that Sanders is really giving her a run here. You'll remember in 2008, the polls showed that she was 12 points behind the weekend before the election. She won by 15 points. So there is some support here from her, but that, that support came mainly from blue-collar, middle-class people who are now going to Trump, and I, I think she's going to have a trouble with Sanders. See, I think it's exactly that victory which suggests to me that he's wrong. She won before. She has virtually every single elected official on her side, shades of New Hampshire, I would argue. If she loses the Sanders, if these polls hold, it's a big deal for him, no? Or is it just Massachusetts? It, it, it's just Massachusetts, but with an asterisk. The polls show that all the, the next states that are voting, most of them seem to be going in her direction. I think it does speak to a certain underlying weakness or lack of, uh, you know, lack of conviction in her campaign among Democratic voters. What do you mean by that? Well, Massachusetts is, you know, we got the spillover from a lot of the New Hampshire coverage. We certainly see more of it than, than most other places. And so the fact that in a state that has a tendency to be very pro-establishment democratic um, is, is tilting in Sanders' direction, at least potentially, speaks to a, a certain weakness in her support. Did you change your mind yet? No. It, okay. Let me just tell you, the demographics have changed in the last eight years. There, you can see it. You check with the election officials, and particularly this year, a lot of Democrats in the Merrimack Valley, out in Worcester County, are moving to independence. Those are the people who are going over to Trump. Those are the towns she, she carried. And they can vote in either primary. They, uh, yeah, once Manchester, you're an independent, right. yeah. you can vote. And in, in 2008, she had those towns and she had those votes coming out heavily. Barack Obama went up Route 2, Cambridge, out to Concord, Lincoln, and, and, and the liberal vote. And, he, and Sanders will pick up all that in a heavy way, but she has lost her demographic. But even if you're right about the analysis about the change in these intervening years, Frank, mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is the bottom line. If she loses a state, she won with significant support from the party establishment, it hurts, does it not? Well, it'll be another defeat for her, yes. I, I, I'm not diminishing that. 
I'm just uh, saying that I mean I, in terms I, you know, of Super you know, Tuesday, it's not the why biggest. is she going to lose? And I, I don't think it's as as much if she rooted does. in yeah. If she does lose, but if she does lose, it'll a lot of be do to do with the, the dynamics of what has happened in the last eight years. The Republicans no play here. I mean, Trump was leading the most recent poll I saw. There's no presence like there was today on the Republican side, right? No, I mean Republican politics in Massachusetts is not. It's not the biggest or most expansive uh, group of people that Except you would ever governor. imagine. That, there, Except for that Republican, governor, but that's right? a that's a that's a big uh, big exception. I, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think the problem is necessarily that Massachusetts will lose Hillary the nomination. It does the whatever problem she's having here is a problem that is um, manifest in other parts of the Before country. I, no, I agree with that. I agree with Duncan. No, no, Before we switch, that. I want to get your response to the the tweet of a fairly high profile. Massachusetts guy, I wanted to read you what he had to say. Two-party system completely broken. Bloomberg should run, more importantly, long-term. Third-party construct I'm not needed. touching that with a 10-foot pole. Oh, that's your boss, isn't it? My boss? Do you want to comment on that? No, I have no comment. Do you comment. want to comment on that? <laughs> uh, uh, not I necessarily. Think so. Fine. Not okay. necessarily. I, I will say I think that there is something about our political institutions that make a two-party system almost an inevitability. One my, courageous my, man in my the crowd. My comment is it? just, just win us the World Series, please. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> on January 20th, Senator Brian Joyce visited us to discuss his ethical Prevails. Today, the IRS and FBI visited his law office for the same reason. Last month, the Boston Globe's Andrea Estes wrote this story about Joyce's get Joyce getting free laundry services for his family and himself for about a decade, which was just the latest in a series of stories about complaints that led to state ethics and campaign finance investigations. Right after that dry cleaning story ran, we had Governor Charlie Baker on Boston Public Radio and asked him to weigh in. Here's what he had to say. In a situation like this where you have um, a, a private citizen speaking so forthrightly about um, a continuing pattern with respect to uh, this type of, of, of activity. I think, I think this is the sort of thing the Ethics Commission should take a really hard look at. Um, there, there's, there's enough there to justify uh, a review, absolutely. And when the senator joined us here, I asked him if he agreed with the governor that either the Ethics Commission or some appropriate body should investigate. Exactly. I'm sure they'll take a look at it. And you're okay with that? I'm absolutely. We did invite Senator Joyce back today. His office sent a statement from his attorney, which reads, it's unfortunate. Recent stories in the media appear to have sparked an investigation. Senator Joyce has been cooperating with each inquiry that has taken place to date, resulting from those stories, and believes that he has done absolutely nothing wrong. Meanwhile, the state GOP is calling for Joyce to resign. When he was here, Frank, he was brandishing an ethics committee letter saying no further investigation and thousands of dollars of discounted sunglasses he bought for his colleagues. And office campaign and political finance settled for several thousand bucks this uh, graduation party for his kid where he had used campaign funds. What is today about? Do we know for a fact that it's about the dry cleaning or is it about him representing clients who he then lobbied for? What's it about? We don't know, but we can pretty well surmise. And, you know, Ethics Commission, uh, the OCPF, the, the campaign finance regulators, that, you know, that's nothing. When the IRS and the FBI show up at the office, at your law office, take out all these things, there is something very serious going on, and he's got to really have a problem here. And it probably it could very well be the dry cleaning. The IRS being involved would indicate there was some, something about the dry cleaning, taking gratuities and not uh, declaring them on his tax records. Uh, it also could do with uh, his representing an insurance company and uh, the taking in and, uh, and going into talking to regulators, about, state regulators about it. You know, one of the things that the, in the state Senate uh, uh, president's office said we're going to wait, they were concerned, we're going to wait the results of the investigation. I think it was an editorial uh, uh, from your page there, Dante, that basically said part of the problem, that you didn't use these words, is the legislature itself. The ethics laws are so weak in the state. We're one of the minority of states, for example, where a lawyer or legislator did not even need to disclose who his clients are. So he wasn't violating anything when apparently, in terms of disclosure, when he was either lobbying a public agency for one client, filing legislation apparently for another. So the state is partly to blame for this mess, are they not? I think there is a climate in Massachusetts, and it contrasts with other, other states mm -hmm. where lawmakers, uh, public officials are, uh, 
I don't know. I don't know that I want to say that they feel entitled to a certain amount of uh, maneuvering room on ethical issues, but but certainly uh, have taken it. What I think is it is interesting about this case: some of the recent political corruption prosecutions, including the O'Brien prosecution at the probation department, the Tim Cahill pro, uh, <laughs> prosecution. These have been in areas that people thought were kind of. Uh, gray legal areas, and there was a lot of criticism from people on Beacon Hill and outside of those prosecutions because it was kind of fuzzy. If this ends up being an IRS case that there is really, you know, something that's a little more cut and dried, it would be a little bit more unusual. The IRS case being that he received thousands of dollars right. of free services. He said, in fairness to him, that he gave free legal services in return, but we shall see. You know, every time a story like this leads to a potential prosecution, uh, this is because of the Globe's work. Sal de Macy's downfall because of the Globe's work. The probation department, O'Brien, because of the Globe. I say to myself after reading those stories, so are these aberrations or are these symptomatic of corruption in this government and there just aren't enough resources in the Globe and the media to pursue these other things? What's the answer, Frank? You've been there a long time. I think it's just great journalism, <clears throat> particularly you mentioned some of these stories. Andrea Estes is a superb uh, Sal de Macy, this yeah, one, yeah. Sal de Macy, you, you won't, don't want her on your case, you, you know. You, and <clears throat> if you're a politician, and the Globe is, and it's journalism that is practicing, I don't think there's a uh, there's that much aura of corruption oozing out of the state house. How do you house. know? I've been there th long enough to know that 30 years ago, yes, you could feel it. FBI was surrounding the, uh, you know, surrounding the, uh, the Three building. Three colonial speakers in a row. Yeah. Yeah that, that, yeah, that goes back to the 90s. But I, I, I don't think it is as, you know, not every, every leader, every, every political uh, state representative is as corrupt as everybody thinks they are. I think it's, also, I think it's, very, I think it's a tribute to the, uh, to the Boston Globes, uh, you know, constantly uncovering those who, who do violate the law. I agree we with get that, them. and I hope you're right about the other. You, uh, you saw your... a spotlight, and I hope you appreciated that. It was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, so what's your, is this an aberration or is this uh, I potentially think, run deeper? I, I suspect it does run deeper. One, one, one observation, and I used to work in Louisiana, which is not exactly an ethical, um, <laughs> you know, uh, paradise. I do think it's unusual that uh, public officials in Massachusetts and people around state government seem to be willing to defend um, a level of, uh, you know, a level of uh, sort of borderline behavior in a way that I think even people in Louisiana would not do. It's something that people are willing to accept as part of the way politics gets done, and I don't necessarily think that's true in other states. In Louisiana, their governors go to jail. I mean, these are these are our legislative leaders. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to compare it to other states. I'm just saying I, I, I don't think there hasn't been a great. There was no great scandal in the Dukakis administration. The, the, the uh, Romney administration, uh, Salucci administration. But the, to I mean, say there was going no back. scandal, but there were three speakers well, in a row who committed felonies is, you know, it's sort of an odd statement, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think uh, the most serious was Sal DeMaisi, and that was serious. Uh, I think Charlie, Bay, uh, Charlie uh, Flaherty, Flaherty. Was, was, was chased around for... Felony. You know, well, an IRS. He, he, no, it was a, he didn't declare certain gratuities on his, his income tax. They got him on that. And, uh, and, and Finneran, he, he, was, he was just, he lied under oath. Is that corruption? Felony. Uh, you know, it was a felony, but was it corruption? Political corruption? Well, no. he disenf he, he, by what he did, according to the judges in that case, he disenfranchised people of color in terms of a redistricting. That's, what, I'd that's, say that's not that's what corruption. he was charged with. He was charged with denying that he had anything to do with a certain process. A redistricting In plan. a civil case not involving his job as speaker. Can we get back to this just for one second, if we can? What's going to happen to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 Joyce? Is he forced out? I mean, formally, they can't. Does the leadership say, you got to go, Senator Joyce? We don't want the whole Democratic Party and the state Senate tarred by this thing. What happens? I think it depends a lot on what his colleagues think of him. I would defer to Frank on uh, what the opinion around the state house is about him. But it would be ironic if somebody who is less popular gets forced out for you know, for, for something, whereas other people who have a little bit more of a political base stick around longer. Can we end with that? What do his colleagues think about him? He, he's never been popular, um, and he's particularly getting more and more isolated. If he has a friend or two, I don't know about it. And I know the Senate leadership would very much like to see him go, but I don't think you're going to see him. He's under fire now. You don't resign your office. It's a bargaining chip at some point, um, and he'll hang in there as a very unpopular figure.
Dante Ramos, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Frank, it's been far too long. Nice it to is. see you. It's really You're going to shake my hand now. No, do I have to? You have to, yes. Nice to see you.